if we believe with our adult minds that the Bible truly is a revelation from God, then the study and careful attention to that book has to be marvelously important to us. This series of studies about how to read Holy Scripture is built on that very assumption. Over the next 10 sessions, we're going to be looking at the basics of what we sometimes call biblical hermeneutics. We'll come back to that word later. You can see it, and I'll define it for you. But this just has to do with a responsible way of studying, reading, interpreting the Bible. And the 10 sessions that are laid out on the screen in front of you right now largely parallel the arrangement in a book that I've used in college and other classes for a number of years, a book by Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart titled How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And please notice that the word it's there is possessive. It's not a contraction for it is. The worth of the Bible as revelation. How do we take this word from God given to us in the human format of culture and language and history and understand it in a common sense, reliable, trustworthy way so that our lives can be transformed by the truth that God wants us to understand. Lesson one is simply titled, Reading the Bible. And I want to spend a little time with you reading, interpreting, transforming. Those words all are important when it comes to understanding the will of God with regard to Scripture. Let's begin this way. It's hard to overstate the power of a story. Let me illustrate it. My wife and I have a table book of Norman Rockwell illustrations. He didn't call himself an artist, a painter. He said, I'm an illustrator. Early in that book is the plate that is on screen for you right now. When one of our grandchildren was about five years old, we were leafing through the plates of his illustrations in that book and this one caught her eye. And as we moved on another page, two, three, she said, Poppy, can we go back to that little boy? And I thought I knew which one she was talking about. And sure enough, Shelley looked closely at this one. And we moved on. And a couple of minutes, she said, Poppy, can we go back to that little boy? And we did for the third time. And I said, sweetie, what is fascinating about that picture to you? And her answer, I hope I'll never forget. She said, I wish I could get in that picture. I wonder what's going to happen next. Now, that's the power of a story that is brought to us through an illustration, a piece of art, a snapshot photograph or a story well told. She's been to a doctor before, and a doctor has filled up a syringe, and her language, he sticks me with that pen. She's trying to fill in the surround of the story. Where is his mommy? She cried when the doctor stuck her with a pen. Wonder if he's going to cry. Who's going to comfort him? You get the point, right? The Bible is a story well told. It's the redemption story. God's reclaiming his creation through the central figure of Jesus of Nazareth. Scripture is the story of God's, and I'll use the language here of C.S. Lewis, God's intent to reclaim every square inch of his creation. And by the power of that story, 
you and I are being called into it. So it's important that we read the story intelligently and understand what's happening in it. Let's begin, though, with a word of caution. The word of caution begins this way. Not everything that we list as Bible study in our churches would pass the truth and advertising laws. It's not uncommon in those lists to find classes like how to divorce-proof your marriage or how to rear godly children or um, how to do sound financial management or classes about spiritual formation or, for that matter, a class in how to read Scripture. Technically speaking, this class that I'm teaching for 10 weeks with you is not a Bible study class, although we'll be talking about the Bible. We'll look at some particular texts and sections of text. We'll look at some principles that relate to doing Bible study appropriately. But we really are only doing Bible study when we get into the text and sort of go um, section by section. And in those other classes, and I hope in this class on hermeneutics, some wonderful things are going to happen, and you're going to get some things that will be helpful to you. But exploring topics by relating biblical texts to those topics is not the same as Bible study in the truest sense. For example, uh, I teach spiritual formation classes at times and participate in spiritual formation exercises, but that's really not Bible study so much as it is being mentored in the spiritual disciplines. It's important to spiritual growth in life, but Bible study itself has to be the foundation of everything that we do with regard to our families, with regard to our finances, with regard to our prayer life, with regard to spiritual formation. And I believe it's bedrock fundamental. So in this series of classes, I'm going to be encouraging us not to abandon topical studies when appropriate, but to be first and foremost students of the biblical text and to be students in the most responsible of ways. So, with that word of caution sounding, that we preachers need to do less topical preaching and more textual preaching, and that Sunday school classes need really to be Bible study classes most fundamentally, not to disallow the others, but to say studying the text of the Bible responsibly is where spiritual understanding and theological grounding happens. Let's talk about some factors that work against that. I believe there are things that are negative in terms of being responsible and good Bible students. I'm going to name three, and the first one is the fragmentation of the biblical text. Now think about this one for a minute because I'm going to raise an objection or at least a caution again for us to think about in terms of the way you and I have been taught to read the Bible. Most books are written as blocks of text to be read by the reader for the entire block and then to reflect and critically evaluate. We very often don't read the Bible that way. Think about the way we talk about the Bible and we tell someone, well, let's go to Matthew chapter 5, or let's read John 3.16, or let's go to Psalm 23. The first chapter and verse Bible dates from the 16th century and grows out of the Reformation movement. Until then, when the Bible was available in various languages, it was available in terms of large blocks of material. 1 Corinthians, the Gospel of John, the book of Isaiah. If you think about the way, for example, the King James Bible is versified, every verse of the Bible is written as a separate paragraph. What were you taught in English class about paragraphs? Those are thought units. 
it is not the case that every verse in the Bible is a complete thought unit. Large blocks of material are meant to be studied as blocks of material and not phrases and sentences taken out of those contexts. So sometimes the way we read the Bible so fragments it that we jump around here, there, with the use of a concordance maybe, where we find the same word being found, but contextually, very different things are being talked about. The way the Bible is put together for us makes us less likely to read those large sections. And we take disconnected verses, verses that in their context don't really fit one another, and we put them together in what I call a string of pearls fashion. Now again, don't get me wrong. I like the convenience of being able to say, turn to John chapter 3 and look at verse 16. But that's not the best way to read the Bible. The best way to read the Bible is to read the Gospel of John. The same way you read Plato or Aristotle or John Grisham. You read the entire block of material and any given word or section you interpret in the larger context. It just takes away the story element if we read only fragments. There is a single unfolding theme in the Bible, and that is uh, the redemption and renewal and rescue of all of God's cosmos, and all of that has focus around the central figure of Jesus of Nazareth. We fragment the text, and we miss the story. That leads to what we call proof texting, uh, cherry picking, my favorite verse, throwing this verse from my tribe against you out of your tribe, and lining up verses to confirm our biases, our prejudices, our preconceptions. In doing that, the Bible can become um, sort of a good luck charm. And we have our handful of proof texts or cherry-picked favorite verses, and we miss the larger story. This class is going to ask that we all think more deeply about feasting on the whole of the revealed Word of God, the full story, rather than snacking on Scripture McNuggets. Now, that Scripture McNuggets idea is, is not for me. That's a Philip Yancey idea, but I think he's right. A lot of Christians are unhealthy because of our diets. We think we can be healthy eating McNuggets when we need a balanced diet. We think we can be healthy with our few favorite Bible verses and proof texts when what we need is to be immersed in that whole story of Revelation. Number two. A factor that works against a responsible, helpful reading of the Bible is, in my judgment, our peculiar American temperament. The Enlightenment that began three, four hundred years ago urged people to reject any sort of central communal authority in favor of individualism, thinking for yourself, going your own way, uh, the lone individual standing against uh, some oppressive power. Do I want to deny that there's real value to that? Well, of course not. And do I want to deny that there have not been benefits to come from the Enlightenment mentality? Of course, there have been. But Americans have taken this mindset of the rugged individual to an ultimate negative form. And one of the ways that shows itself in religion we read the Bible so individualistically. And instead of doing it within a community of discernment, the larger body of Christ, the church, we read the Bible as a, well, it's me and God, so I can work it out to go to heaven kind of thing. And when we do it that way, we also develop a penchant for division and schism. If I'm reading my Bible and I come up with an idea or I'm convinced of this and the group that I'm with doesn't agree, uh, I'll leave the group. I'll go form my own new church. And people 
that's the history of modern Protestant denominationalism in which we are so caught up in the Western world. Literally now, thousands of different denominations because in the post-Enlightenment era, the individuality and even at times the idiosyncratic readings of Scripture that someone comes up with creates a whole new movement, a whole new denomination. I think we also have to be warned against prioritizing devotional reading over serious study. Now, I've already made a point earlier about what we call spiritual formation. Spiritual formation is built around the devotional reading of the Bible, where you may see a word or a phrase, you may read the same section of text or a few verses or one of the Psalms day after day for a week or a month, or you may read the Bible through in a year. And in the devotional reading, what you're looking for is something just to stimulate you subjectively uh, to the notion of the transcendent, to link to God. That sort of devotional reading sometimes produces heresy as well. Serious study of the Bible doesn't turn all of us into academics, but it does make all of us conscientious to put the guardrails around our devotional reading to study the history, the context, the meaning of words seriously before we stray too far afield subjectively. We preachers have fostered jumping around with our topical preaching. It isn't just the Bible classes that are too often too topical or using devotional reading to replace serious study. We must learn to re-enter the biblical world rather than demanding that we should, we should be allowed to just let the Bible flop open where it will and believe that God's going to take me to the page and to the word and the phrase that I'm going to need for that day or for the rest of my life. It doesn't work that way. And we have to take some disciplined effort, study, work, uh, to get back into that biblical world, study some history, study some things about Jewish culture, study some things about the Roman period. We have to not become experts in, in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek, but we do have to be careful that we don't put English meanings of words back into the biblical text we have to use some good discussion and study tools to make sure we're reading what the original author was trying to communicate. The third factor that I want to warn against as a potential negative are just the current cultural influences and pressures of our day. What do I mean by that? We're a soundbite world. A Twitter sloganeering, uh, choose your champion to lead you in, in education, in politics, in religion, in whatever, rather than being critical thinkers. Now, to be a critical thinker is not to be a cynic and to question and gouge. Critical thinking simply means you weigh multiple factors and you actually put serious intellectual effort into drawing right conclusions. You use your common sense for the lack of a better way to say it. Fewer and fewer people in this generation seem to be reading anything with length and substance, anything that demands serious engagement. We read the light and the short and the brief and the summary. The Bible asks that we take God's Word seriously. We're increasingly, of course, a video culture, a visual world as opposed to the ancient oral or modern literary culture. The Bible was produced in the pre-modern culture that was an oral culture. Reading and writing were not the norm. In the time of Jesus, what, maybe 12 or 15 percent of people could read, and sometimes reading simply meant make something that approximated uh, the writing of one's name. Uh, in a modern world, uh, the publishing of books and, and widespread literacy, that became the norm. 
Today, we're more and more neither oral nor literary as we are video culture, and we can be swayed very easily emotionally by a visual image that contradicts anything that might be critical thinking. We are increasingly in this era of relativism, a find your own truth deep inside yourself people, rather than a find the truth out there by examining the facts, or in this case, reading the Word of God. Tim Keller says one of the great differences in the modern mindset is people used to believe that Truth, with a capital T, was out there in the person of Jesus and in the Word of God. And our task is to approximate, search for, uh, pray, and read, and attempt to find that truth and adjust our thinking and lives to it. The modern idea is that truth is inside us and anything else, including God and ethics, has to be adapted to what we want. I think he's correct, and that's a very anti-Christian pressure. In this postmodern world of ours, what some have called moralistic therapeutic deism has currency over historic Christian orthodoxy. Moralistic, eh, you want to be a good person, but the good person idea is more in the therapeutic sense you want to be somebody who has a happy life and you want to be an authentic person and find your own truth and live up to it. And the deism, yeah, you may believe that there's a God behind all this, but he's not really too caught up in what's happening. We make our own happiness and we are our own gods for all practical purposes. So when we think about interpreting the Bible. You've probably heard someone say, well, people don't really need to interpret the Bible. They just need to read it and do what it says. Well, I think there's something right about that statement. I'm sure what the person means is a version of the point I've been trying to make. Personal taste and cultural dictates don't determine what we ought to do with our lives. We should hear that from the Word of God and respond to it. But what's wrong with this statement is it's a bit naive and simplistic to say that one can go to the Bible and it simply falls off the page and overwhelms us as to what the will of God is about all things that are important. Like it or not, if you read anything you are involved in the process of interpretation. And that includes the Bible. The Bible and its modern readers are both embedded in certain cultures with a prehistory to us and certain languages and traditions. And words and ideas from those ancient and modern cultures don't always align very well. And it takes some effort to sort it out. The word church, for example, to most people in our time probably means a property or a building, and it's a landmark. When you get to the church, turn left. And flesh means sinews and bones. You study the Bible, you realize that's not what the word church means in Scripture, and that's not especially in the Apostle Paul. What he means when he talks about the flesh and the life of flesh over against the life of the Spirit. Scriptures get misused because we don't transfer well from culture to culture. When I was young, I heard sermons preached out of Deuteronomy 22 about women wearing slacks or girls wearing jeans to church because, well, the Bible says a woman shouldn't wear a man's clothes. Is that really what's going on in Deuteronomy 22? Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me, said Paul. Oh, I've seen that in athletic locker rooms. Is that what Philippians 4 is about? We can beat the better team because we're from a Christian school? Or if we believe in Jesus, 
uh, we can do these things that otherwise we have no reasonable expectation of doing. Hey, I can't play quarterback in the NFL, even though I'm a Christian. And in Jesus, I can do everything Paul was talking about in Philippians 4. But it wasn't surmounting personal goals. That's a misuse of Scripture. 3 John 2 is used by health and wealth gospel people to say things the text doesn't say. 1 Corinthians 14.34 about women keeping silent in the church. Paul's either forgotten or contradicting what he's already written in chapter 11, or you need to do some work with the context of that chapter and what's specifically being said in that verse. Like it or not, you can't simply go to the text and read it and throw it in a person's face. You actually have to get behind it as to what's going on in that larger context. We'll talk more about that um, in the next two sessions. Truth is, no one ever simply reads something without interpreting it. Even in English, if I use the expression to you, hey, we've had a really bad run, what might that mean? Well, maybe some ideas are coming to your mind. It might be what a CEO says about the company and the bottom line for the last two or three quarters. It could be what a couple has said about their exercise regimen for that morning and having a bad run because, well, it was cold or it was raining or one of them stumbled and fell. Okay, uh, forgive me here. I'm a Vanderbilt alumnus, so don't think that I'm putting you down if you are. It could be a comment about Vanderbilt's football team over the last five or ten or, well, five or ten decades. Um, we've had a really bad run. You don't simply read that and automatically know what it means. What about the statement, he saved her? That could be what a lifeguard did for the little girl who was about to go under for the third time. It could be a comment about a mixed doubles tennis tournament where the male partner hit a marvelous shot that saved her gaff on the previous one that almost lost them the match or the tournament. Some of you work with computers and you keep your tax uh, data on them and somebody helps you find a lost file or, or a corrupted file. Oh, he saved her. And of course, in our context, maybe we're talking about Jesus and what he has done in the life of someone who has turned to him. We never simply read. We always have to interpret what's the context, who's talking, and then what does that mean? Illustrations could go on and on, and I don't want to overwork them, but we had a gay old time time was, that could be an innocent statement about enjoying an evening. Today, it could be either a moral confession or, on the part of some, a moral boast. The bark was agonizing. Well, maybe somebody's talking about the, the sound the dog made that hurt his ears, or maybe a pet lover is talking about the sound the dog made that signaled that it was in pain. And, of course, it could mean Somebody was skiing and they hit a tree and they've got scars from the bark of the tree to prove how disastrous the collision was. We never simply read without interpreting. Here's an illustration that I've found helpful and used at various times. You think about the horizon of the text. All of the factors about the culture, the history, the language, the life experience, the trauma that, say, Moses experienced 1,500 years before the birth of Christ, that's part of the horizon of the text of, let's say, uh, the Torah, the Pentateuch, uh, the book of Exodus. But then you think about the horizon of someone reading that now, 3,500 years later. We're reading in a very different language, in a very different part of the world, in a very different kind of culture, and the stuff that gets in the way when the presuppositions and uh, our ignorance of those uh, events and customs, our inability to deal with the language or the idiom of those languages, 
reading and studying the Bible is not as simple as falling off a log. Oh, I think the core message that Jesus is the Son of God and the means to access to God, that's all caps and bold letters. But to go deeply into understanding how the love of God has worked across time to bring us Jesus and what Jesus is calling us to be about in this corporate body of his called the church and in our personal lives as disciples, that's why Bible study, serious, conscientious, critical study of the Bible is valuable. This book that we read, then, that we call the Bible, in one sense, we have to read it like we'd read any other book. Again, Plato, Aristotle, John Grisham. Words and paragraphs and the flow of thought are more important than just picking out a phrase, picking out a verse, a chapter-verse statement. The Bible is not written outside the context of human reason and language and culture in a sort of special language until the work of a man named Adolf Deisman a century ago or so, people thought the New Testament was written in what some of them called Holy Ghost Greek, a different kind of Greek than, than was spoken uh, in the time that Peter and Paul lived. Because the writings of Plato and Aristotle didn't look much like the New Testament. Well, it's because we found out through the work of Deisman and other scholars that while Plato and Aristotle were writing cultured, sophisticated, highbrow prose, the New Testament was written in sort of what we'd call the vernacular, the street language, the simpler language of people. The Bible then was not written in a special language. It was written in the language of time and place, that of the average person. And language and reason and culture and the meaning of words is important. It was John Calvin, I think, who used to say, the Bible is God's baby talk as he attempts to communicate his infinite wisdom to us through the only medium available, which is language. In another sense, of course, though, we read the Bible not as we would read any other book. We read it as unique within all literature because I believe, as Peter says in discussing Scripture in the larger context of Second Peter 1, in two verses in particular in the middle of that discussion, he says, Scripture isn't the result of human will. These people spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them guidance. Paul reaffirmed the same thing when he was writing to one of his protégés, a young man that he mentored in the gospel. And he said, Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable uh, to equip God's people for his holy purposes. And that's why in that same letter to Timothy, Paul gives a mandate. And the mandate out of 2 Timothy 2, when he's discussing Scripture and the importance of it to someone like Timothy for his own personal um, illumination and for his teaching of others in the ways that are right, he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. We have to hear that as a mandate for us as well. Why do we say the Bible is both divine and human? For the same reason we say Jesus is both divine and human. He is God come among us, but in ordinary human fashion, able to be tempted in all the ways we are. The Bible is God-breathed, the will of God expressed in human language, pointing us to Jesus, and yet it's altogether human, an earthy book that's expressed in ordinary human language that reflects the culture and the history and the time and the place of production. Gordon Fee, the author of the book I referred to earlier, said, God did not choose to give us a series of timeless, non-culture-bound theological propositions to be believed and imperatives to be obeyed. We might call that bullet points. Rather, he chose to speak his eternal word this way in historically particular circumstances and in every kind of literary genre. 
By the very way God gave us this word, he locked in the ambiguity. One should not fight God and insist that he give us his word in another way, or as we're more apt to do, rework his word along theological or cultural prejudgments that turn it into a minefield of principles, propositions, or imperatives, but denude it of its ad hoc character as truly human. The ambiguity is part of what God did in giving us the word in this way. It's important for us to understand that the will and word of God are given to us in this unique but important way, and it lends itself to our following not a set of concrete rules that generate guaranteed outcomes, but that we use sound principles that we would in reading any piece of literature that we thought was important. And that's what this series of studies is going to call us to do. I hope you'll want to be part of it and that you'll be with us next time. God bless you in your study of the Word.